Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Species Shorts. My name is Lindsay Barone, and I am an anthropologist that works with the DNA Learning Center. In today's episode, just like in the ones that we had last week, um, we will be focusing on one specific species within the hominin fossil record. So for those of you who watched the first three episodes, you may remember that we talked about just generally what makes a hominin a hominin. We talked about the oldest known hominin, which is a species called Sahelanthropus chidensis, and it's about 7 million years old. And then we talked about one of the most unique early hominins um, that's about 4.4 million years old and is a species called Artipithecus ramidus. Today, we're going to move forward a little bit in time, talk about something a little bit more modern, and that is this species right here. Um, so it's a little bit dark, a little bit hard to see um, just because of the material that the cast is made out of. Um, but this is a species named Australopithecus afarensis. So to kick things off today, I'm just going to hold it up to the camera, let you all take a, a couple of seconds to look at it pretty closely um, and make some observations about it, um, especially um, compared to what our own anatomy looks like. So let's just get it a little bit closer and kind of see there's the face. There's the side of the skull. There's the underside of the skull and this is the face over here and you can see the entire top tooth row. And then this is what it looks like from behind. So what do we know about Australopithecus afarensis? Well, Australopithecus afarensis, I think is probably one of the most discussed, most studied species in the early hominin fossil record. Um, and that is in part because of the discovery of the specimen with the nickname Lucy. Um, so for those of you who were maybe around in the 1970s, you might remember in 1974, when the Lucy fossil was discovered in East, or East Africa, rather, um, she was discovered at a site in Ethiopia called Hadar. Um, so Lucy was discovered in 1974 by a paleontologist or a paleoanthropologist named Donald Johansson. Um, and it, when the fossil was uncovered, it was very, very complete. We have about 40% of this specific individual. Now, this isn't the only Australopithecus afarensis that we have, but like we talked about last week with Artie, it's really helpful and really important to have these fossils that have so many bits of one individual, because that allows us to get a really good look at what the overall anatomical structures may have looked like. Now, some of you may be wondering why this particular specimen has the nickname Lucy in the first place. Um, well, it actually has to do with the beetles. Um, so when they were in this camp in East, East Africa, when they were doing their excavations, one of the songs they kept listening to over and over and over was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So when they began actually removing the Lucy specimen from the ground, um, they, a lot of times paleontologists will give these hallmark individuals nicknames. Um, so like we talked about last week with Artie, that was a nickname. Um, and this one became known as Lucy because of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Now, Lucy allows us a really interesting glimpse into what life was like for Australopithecines at the time they were living. So Australopithecines probably lived for roughly about a million years. Um, the date range for all of the known Australopithecine, or I'm sorry, Australopithecus afarensis specimens um, was between about 3.9 million years ago and 2.9 million years ago. Um, the Lucy specimen as an individual lived probably around 3.2 million years ago. Um, so is a little bit on the more recent end of the Australopithecus afarensis spectrum. Um, we know that she was female. We know that she was likely an adult 
Um, but it seems probable that she was a younger adult. So she doesn't have a lot of the signs of wear and tear that we would expect to find on the skull or the skeleton of an older individual. Um, so she was probably a young adult at the time of her death. Now, what do we know about Australopithecus afarensis as a whole? Well, like Artipithecus ramidus, which we talked about last Friday, um, this species has an interesting mixture of more ape-like primitive characteristics and more modern human-like characteristics. So, for example, one of the things that we see with Australopithecus afarensis is that they tend to be a little bit smaller bodied. Um, so they were not really even four feet tall. They probably were pretty lightweight, probably between about 60 and 90 pounds as adults. Um, they have some adaptations for living up in the trees and moving around sort of quadrupedally through the trees, just like we used to, or like we saw with Artipithecus ramidus. Um, so some of these, uh, some of these adaptations include having a more, um, more upright shoulder joint, which would have allowed for kind of climbing up and down in the branches. Um, they had grasping long curved fingers, which again would have been really good for that tree-based life. Um, they have relatively small brains. Um, not that that necessarily has to do with bipedalism, but it is something that's a little bit more non-human primate-like. Um, so it's a little hard to tell just by looking at this, but you know, I can kind of fit the whole brain right into my left hand. Um, by contrast, again, this is our human skull, um, and you've seen this before if you watch some of the other episodes, um, but this is a much larger brain size. Um, so this is probably about a, a third of the size of a modern human adult brain. So relatively small brained, physically small creatures. Um, Australopithecus afarensis also has what anthropologists describe as being a prognathic face. Now, prognathic faces, that's basically just a fancy way of saying that this sort of bottom area of the face, so what I sometimes describe as the snout area, it sticks out from the rest of our face, from the rest of the face. So rather than being relatively flat the way that our faces are, or you know, you can take a look at our skeleton here, um, or you can feel your own. This one has this projecting outward face. So we just we call this facial prognathism. Um, and this is something that is a little bit more of an ancient trait. This is not something that we see as we start to see more modern hominin species. Another thing that um, we see that's a little bit more ancient in Australopithecus afarensis is the shape of the tooth row. So this is sometimes called the dental arcade, um, but you can kind of see how these teeth on Australopithecus afarensis are basically a U shape. And you may remember last week we talked a little bit about how modern human teeth tend to have more of a parabolic shape. So the jaw gets wider as you go back towards the molars. Um, this is something that is starting to change. You can kind of see it getting a little bit wider in afarensis, which is in my right hand, but it doesn't quite look very modern yet. One thing that is really modern about the afarensis teeth though, is that they're starting to have really thick molar enamel. Um, so having thick molar enamel is particularly good if you're going to be eating a lot of really tough material. Um, and in particular, it seems likely that Australopithecus afarensis was eating things like sweet potatoes um, and other kinds of roots and sort of tough woody material. Now, what makes this a more modern looking species? So why do we sort of view this as a really important stepping stone in the evolution of the hominin lineage? Well, there are some hallmarks of obligate, or I'm sorry, of habitual bipedalism in this particular species. So one of those things is something that we've talked about in other uh, episodes of Species Shorts, and that is, um, 
That is the position of the foramen magnum. So remember, foramen magnum means basically big hole or great hole in uh, Latin. Um, and that's the place where your spinal cord matches up with your head. In a biped, that tends to be closer to the face. In a quadruped, so another animal that's on all fours, that tends to be closer to the back of the skull. Australopithecus afarensis, like all of the other hominins we've talked about so far, does in fact have a more um, centrally located, so closer to the face um, foramen magnum. So that would have been good for balancing the skull on top of the body when moving around on two legs. Um, another thing that we see when we look at the feet of Australopithecus afarensis is that that divergent big toe that we talked about last Friday with Artie. Um, so that's starting to become a little bit less. So rather than sticking out all the way to the side, the big toe is a little bit more in line with the other toes on the Australopithecus afarensis feet. So there are some really interesting adaptations going on that are, are enabling them to become better bipeds. One of the other really cool pieces of evidence for bipedalism in Australopithecus is a set of fossilized footprints. And these are, they're called the Lytoli footprints from a site in Tanzania where Australopithecines have been found. The Lytoli footprints were basically made by at least two Australopithecus afarensis individuals walking through a, essentially a patch of wet volcanic ash. There was a volcano right near the site. It had been erupting. It laid down the ash mixed with some water, and it basically became like cement. So these individuals were walking side by side through this wet ash. Those footprints became fossilized. So they were pre preserved for about 3 million years. When they were discovered, it allowed anthropologists to really get a good up close glimpse of what it was like to be a bipedal Australopithecine. And most notably, there's confirmation that they were in fact bipedal. So there are only foot marks and there's no hand marks in the Lytoli footprints. So it's a really cool, really rare piece of evidence that supports what it is we're seeing with respect to the anatomy. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in today's episode is stone tool making. For a really long time, it was believed that no early hominins were making stone tools until you get to the genus Homo. And the genus Homo, of course, is our genus. That does not actually appear to be the case. And in fact, the oldest potential evidence for stone tool making is found in association with Australopithecus afarensis sites. So there is a site in Ethiopia um, called Dikika, which is also famous because there's been an, a, a toddler Australopithecine found there. Um, but at this particular site, um, there has been some animal bones with cut marks on them. And these bones with cut marks date to the exact same time period that Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis was living in this area. Now, cut marks are very distinct. There's really no questioning it when you find a cut mark what it is. Now, this was at about 3.4 million years ago. So for a while, there was a little bit of a debate like, oh, well, maybe there was something else. We haven't found any stone tools. We just have these cut marks. Um, and then at a site, in Kenya um, on the shore of Lake Turkana, they found some evidence of stone tools in association with Australopith Australopithecus afarensis fossils. So these are really basic tools. Um, they're basically good for grinding and pounding. They're not good for much else. Um, so because of that, um, we've actually pushed back the date of the oldest known stone tools in the hominin fossil record to about 3.3 million years ago. All right, um, so that is all I have for you all today. 
Um, if you have any more questions on Australopithecus afarensis, um, please drop them in the comments on the video. Otherwise, have a great afternoon, and I will see you all on Wednesday.